What's up ladies and sluts for index funds? My name is Caleb Hammer and this is your week in money. Yo dog, I heard you like some inflation. So I put some inflation in your inflation. We wanted those Federal Reserve rate cuts in June, right? <laughs> Good luck. Because on Wednesday of this week, consumer prices rose 3.5% in March of this year, year over year. Kill me now. Ah, CPI, or Consumer Price Index. Here we track good and services prices across the United States economy. A month prior, in February, CPI was up 3.2% year over year. So yeah, 3.5% isn't making economists or like literally any other human being that's existing in the United States of America feel good right now. Last month, we saw a CPI increase of 0.4% month over month, but many economists expect this number to be closer to 0.3%. Now, if you exclude food and energy prices, which tend to be more volatile, these core prices rose 3.8% year over year. Just a reminder in all of this that the Fed's year over year inflation target is 2%. So yeah. Those, those rate cuts, right? These past few months, the Fed has played down this more sticky inflation, insinuating that January and February numbers were just seasonal quirks. Of course, the goal in the end from the rapid inflation we saw a year ago or so is to achieve a soft landing from the Fed. This essentially means that as inflation cools via the rate hikes, they're also mitigating an aggressive downturn in the overall economy. That's the goal. Now, some officials in the Fed have already been calling for rate cuts. But this week's data is making it harder for the Fed to move on that. Rates right now are the highest they've been in 23 years, and I personally don't see that changing until maybe towards the end of the year at the soonest now. That being said, Last month, a narrow majority of officials in the Fed thought at least three cuts could happen this year if inflation continued to decline. But again, now we have these sticky numbers. Even though in the minority, a few officials did come out and suggested they were iffy about this prospect. Jerome Powell himself has said that officials would need to be more confident that inflation is returning sustainably to 2% before any substantial moves. We do see the risks as two-sided, so it's constant consequential, he said last month. I will say, even though we'd all love to see rates come down while also seeing CPI closer to 2%, I do sleep a bit better now with 3.5 year over year now instead of the 9% we saw a year ago. That being said, studies show that Americans are simply frustrated by our cost of living. At the same time though, consumer sentiment recently showed the biggest two month increase since 1991 and American consumer spending is incredibly strong. People are struggling, but we've seen on my main channel where I host the show Financial Audit, people aren't really willing to accept cutting luxuries and wants when faced with hard financial choices. Many would argue that morally people shouldn't have to make those choices but we simply don't live in that economic system which many don't want to hear. 74% of Americans say that inflation has moved in the wrong direction over the past year. While 0.4% month over month is more than the 0.3% we expected, and 3.5% year over year is worse than the desired 2%, I'll still take that over the 9% year over year we saw recently. But I do understand because shit's expensive, and that's certainly no different for housing either. Playing a silly game, it's not gonna happen. The rent too damn high movement, the people I'm here to represent can't afford to pay their rent. The average 30-year fixed rate mortgage has been chilling around 6.8%, which is up from the 6.6% we saw at the end of 2023, and much higher than the 3.7% we saw in late 2019. Those rate cuts, we want them. Good luck to us all for that. Either way, the Fed prefers using monthly reports from the Commerce Department, which shows inflation rates lower than CPI. Those numbers come out towards the end of this month, so make sure to be subscribed for that. Who wants a fun new fight over student loans? forgiveness. Woo. On Monday morning, Joe Biden announced his latest proposal to beat down some of that student loan debt for nearly 30 million Americans. Thanks to what we're doing, that student debt is no longer holding you back. But we all know what happened last time state challenges, court decisions, and people still thinking for some reason that their student loan debt is going to be forgiven at this point. Somehow, but what's different this time? Biden's original plan, which was overturned in mid-2023 by the United States Supreme Court, would have canceled up to $20,000 in student loan debt for borrowers making less than $125,000 a year. This time, Biden is proposing to cancel up to $20,000 in unpaid interest for borrowers who owe more than their initial loan amount. So if you're single and <clears throat> lonely, like 
me you'd need to earn less than hundred twenty thousand dollars a year to qualify if you're not such a man whore like myself and you're married you'd need to earn less than two hundred forty thousand dollars a year combined debt would also be canceled for borrowers who took out loans to attend what the white house calls low financial value programs this is basically schools where the federal student loan programs were like nah when it comes to borrowing Papa Biden's money. 25 million borrowers would be eligible for the interest forgiven part of the program. The Biden administration says that they'll roll out the new proposals in phases over the next few months and that it still might take a few months after that to become finalized. In a shocking turn of events that no one who has existed in the last few years would have expected, Republican state attorneys generals have said, F you, no thank you, and that they're gonna challenge the Biden administration. The main argument is that Papa B is overstepping in his authority and misinterpreting interpreting the Higher Education Act from 1965. The main point of these new actions from the Biden administration is to assist people who have been paying back their student loans for 20 years or more. And I, just like anyone, have massive amounts of sympathy for those who are struggling with any kind of debt burden. At the same time, I also truly believe that if you signed a contract that you're going to borrow money, you're responsible for it. But at the same time, student loans are one of the absolute hardest debts to be forgiven through any kind of bankruptcy. So not all debt is the same. Is there really any true benefit to the overall society by forgiving debt without changing the system that got us here in the first place. This will just have to be repeated over and over and over again until someone actually does something to change it. So sure, it might help a few people right now, but here are the facts. Right now, student loan debt in the United States totals $1.727 trillion, federal being $1.602 trillion, or 92.8% of all student debt. 43.2 million borrowers have federal student loan debt with the average balance being $37,088. The average public university student borrows $32,637 to obtain just the bachelor's degree. Not that I want those who would have their debt forgiven to suffer, but are we really accomplishing anything here? If you want to fix the problem, you need to actually fix the problem, not just dab the wound a couple of times and call it good. To be transparent, I've always been torn on this issue from a moral, logical, ethical, and mathematical perspective. But regardless of any opinion on this issue, does anyone really think that this will be held up by the Supreme Court? And does that even matter? It's an election year. Recent polls show that Biden is actually trailing Trump among adults under 30, something that not many of us would have expected, you know, based on the normal political climate. Is this just an election year political calculus? Do you think that forgiveness plans such as this should go through? Will the Supreme Court uphold this one or shut it down like the last? Let me know in the comments below. Anyone remember when the choo-choo went poo-poo? That said, my first reaction when this crossed was that this number was low, given how many people are affected in this community and the, in the greater community. Northfolk Southern decided that East Palestine, Ohio was a great place to derail a train. But this week, instead of Thomas flying off the rails again, Northfolk Southern finally announced a tentative settlement, while also saying it doesn't reflect any admission of liability, wrongdoing, or fault, of course. But the settlement is pending approval in the U.S. District Court in Ohio. Over a year ago now, on February 3rd of 2023, 38 cars of the train conveniently found itself no longer on the tracks and caused the town of East Palestine, Ohio to gain national attention and force its residents into a world of chaos. We request that everyone stay out of the area so first responders and Norfolk Southern personnel can continue to assess and work at the scene. 4,700 people live there, and many of them were put at risk of contamination and adverse health effects from the accident. Get out of here, grab the baby and go. Wallace says water from the Sulphur Run Creek leaked into her home. She has since moved away from there. There were evacuations that happened pretty quickly, but many say they were exposed to chemicals after returning still. The costs associated with the derailment alone surpassed $1 billion, though to give North Folk some credit, they have been making payments to local residents through a community assistant program. There are still lawsuits facing the company from the state of Ohio and the United States Environmental Protection Agency. All this while they're literally facing a proxy fight with an activist investor. That being said, North Folk stock did go up on Tuesday, which was the day of the settlement announcement. Big fun this week for all party involves. It's a choo-choo party. All right, let's get into your weekly stock market updates. The S&P 500, my personal favorite index, week over week, we're down 1.56%, but year over year, we're up 13.48%. Let's go. The Dow Jones, week over week, 
Again, we're down 2.37%, but year to date, we are up 12.76%. Gold, everyone's personal favorite inflation hedge. Week over week, we're up 0.6%, and year over year, we're up 16.28%. Oil, my favorite sludge to bathe around in. Week over week, we're down 1.59%, and year over year, we're up 2.7%. Also, some fun major movers this week are Apple, which is up 4.11%, this week, Google up 3.43%, and Coinbase up 2.05%. They're back! This time, are they clogging our city streets? Crews by GM are the driverless vehicles that caused a massive amount of controversy last fall by having their autonomous cars get stuck in weird situations and also, uh, you know, dragging someone along after a hit and run in cities like San Francisco and Austin, Texas. In October of last year, crews suspended their driverless operations across the entire entire United States after a massive YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter storm posted many instances of their chaos. I'm says Cruz by GM, including the explosion that comes after that clip probably in our future. However, are they really back? Well, kind of, but this time the driverless cars are coming back with uh, drivers, an industry milestone, making progress like never before. This time, the drivers are going around Phoenix, Arizona and collecting map data and plans to further expand to other cities across the United States. With the data they collect, they plan to further understand speed limits, stop signs, traffic lights, and hopefully how to not be complete traffic piles of shit. Our goal is to earn trust and build partnerships with the communities such that Ultimately, we resume fully driverless operations in collaborations with a city, the company said in a blog post. You see, my city, Austin, Texas, was one of the locations where nearly 400 self-driving cars were taxiing around people in the back seats once the sun went down. Spotted in West Campus early Sunday morning, one driverless car, then another, then another. Now they aren't here, which is a great example of GM's incredibly successful $1 billion acquisition of Cruise in 2016. Sadly, last October, a woman was hit by a hit and run driver in San Francisco and then landed in the path of a driverless Cruise car. The car was trying to pull over, but it went about another 20 feet before coming to a stop with the woman under it. I really hope this never happens again, but if it does, Please let it be me so I can sue the shit out of them and pay off my student loans. A few weeks after this happened, California said eh, and yanked away their autonomous driving permit. The Justice Department and Securities and Exchange Commission are still investigating Cruz's handling of the woman surfing incident. And now that a quarter of the company has been fired, I guess it's time to get back out there and definitely never hit anyone ever again. Let's talk about Blackstone, everyone's favorite shadow company that owns the entire world. Wait, that's, that's BlackRock. BlackRock. Uh, no, okay, so again, today we're talking about Blackstone. Definitely a different company in which there are no conspiracy theories about. So that's good news, but this week they did agree to acquire Air Communities, an apartment income REIT. What is a REIT? As the fat cats would say, it's a way for the poors to pretend like they'll own some real estate at some point in their lives. Essentially, companies that own or finance real estate that is hopefully income producing. To oversimplify things, REITs essentially allow you to invest in these markets through them. Blackstone says, ooh, yummy, yummy, Air Community owns 76 rental housing communities, and I'd like to gobble them all up into my portfolio. They also announced they'd be investing another $400 million into improving those properties, so I guess not the most evil landlords. This is Blackstone's largest transaction in the multifamily market, so if you think more competitive rents compared to owning a home is here to stay for the rest of your your life well just look at what the market leaders are doing they clearly see a massive money's making path going forward this also might indicate a shift from office buildings to apartment complexes across the industry workplace flexibility maybe maybe not yeah commercial property is down investors purchased 359.5 billion dollars worth of american commercial property now of course that many billion dollars is actually just pocket change because of course it was only half the deal volume from the previous 12 month period. But for all the evil landlords such as myself, we did see that $18 billion of US commercial mortgage backed securities were issued in the first quarter of this year, which is up three times from the previous year. Let's milk your basic human necessity. But 
of course, just kidding, because this is just for commercial shit. So your boss actually might want to make you come back into the office soon. But Blackstone is going hard. They agreed to acquire a portfolio of 38 thousand single family rental homes for 3.5 billion dollars earlier this year they're seriously starting to make those money moves john palowski an analyst at green street says investors such as blackstone are beginning to see opportunity because they consider the property held by some companies to be worth more than where the stocks are trading in the public markets so here we go ladies and gentlemen get ready women's college basketball now owns tv ratings which is something i don't think any of us thought a news show would talk about even just a few years ago not only did the ncaa women's basketball final dominate sports tv ratings but it actually beat the men's final for the first time in history starting just last year in 2023 women's basketball viewing started to race towards the moon more than doubling in views every year since 2022 last sunday 18.9 million viewers tuned in which was four times what we saw just two years ago. The last time a basketball game had numbers that beat that was Virginia versus Texas Tech in the 2019 NCAA men's final. Men's basketball is getting kind of sad though. Since 2014, viewership for the men's final has been on a steady decline. Kind of reminds me of the 1990s Japanese stock market. Rip. So yeah, for context, remember that 18.9 million viewers watched this year's women's final, but only 14.8 million viewers watched the men's final between Connecticut and Purdue. Now, to be clear, it did help that the women's final aired on ABC, which is owned by Disney, and that gave it a much wider audience across their potential platforms that the men's final, which was aired on Warner Bros. Discovery's TBS and forced you to have a cable TV subscription, which by the way, has lost more than a quarter of its industry subscribers over the past decade. The women's game aired on Sunday afternoon, which typically gets less eyeballs historically versus the men's game in a traditionally higher viewed time slot on Monday evening. So there's a couple obvious reasons for this massive increase in viewership for women's NCAA basketball. Caitlin Clark being one of them, she's becoming the moment and good old sports betting. It's been on the rise for a few years now, and that is certainly no different in women's basketball. That being said, the women's final game received 99% less TV money than the men's final, even though it got more views. 